Hey folks and welcome to what's come to be known as Carbon Garage and as you'll see today we don't have either the TVR or the Abarth we do in fact have a 5 litre Ford Mustang The more observant of you will also note that this isn't actually Scotland either this is in fact California, Death Valley National Park to be precise and as you may imagine this is actually a rental so, what's a rental Mustang doing on this channel, you may ask? Well, being a 5 litre, front engine, V8, rear wheel drive car, I thought it'd be interesting to compare a few aspects of this car with the TVR. They're probably not cars that you would traditionally sort of compare side by side. You know, I can't imagine there's a huge number of people who are saying, do I buy a TVR Camaro or Griffith versus a Ford Mustang? But there probably are some who just want that sort of V8 experience and aren't really too bothered with what, you know, they actually get. And the reality is that these cars start at around about 35 to 40,000 pounds in the UK. So within just a few years time, these are probably gonna be low to mid 20,000 pounds. And that very much puts them in the same bracket as these TVRs. So there probably is actually gonna be some people who are gonna sort of think, hmm, maybe I should buy this, maybe I should buy that. So what we're gonna cover in this video is not so much a review of this car because there's a million other people online who have already done that. But what we will do is we'll do a little bit of a comparison. We'll have a little bit of fun and I'll explain to you why as much as I think this is a very, very competent and capable car. In fact, it's quite a brilliant car. I don't particularly like it. Although, you know, many caveats go with that. Let's explain in a sec. So five litre V8, rear wheel drive, lots of power, not a huge amount of grip. What's not to like about this car? And it's a very interesting question because in many ways, I actually do really like this car. But at the same time, I find myself sort of rationalizing it and saying, you know, it's, it's actually got surprisingly good chassis. You can have quite a lot of fun with it. You can really balance it on the throttle. The front end grip is superb, which means you've got excellent turn in. It's actually, it's quite a lot of fun to drive. So in a rational sense, I actually find myself thinking, this is something I would consider buying. But yeah, I've been driving this now for a week and it's actually the second time I've had a Mustang um, on rent. The first time it wasn't the V8, it was the V6, but you know, most of the car is, is pretty similar. So it's the second time I've had one and I've never really left sort of thinking I would really like to own one of these. Whereas with the other cars that I've rented in the past, for example, I had a BMW 330 um, a couple of years ago. I left that, handed back the keys at the end of the week. And one of the first things I then started doing was having a look at the BMW online configurator to see how much would it cost to get a car that I like. And with the Mustangs, for a few reasons which are mostly intangible, I just don't find myself doing that. But that said, I do actually quite enjoy having them for a short period of time. And I think in an environment like this, in their native land of America, I think you're hard pushed to find a more competent sort of car that fits so well with everything around about it you know this is not a place where you've got tight twisty roads in fact this part where i'm stopped here is about as exciting as it's got for the last 50 miles sweeping left hander and then a bit of a kink to the right so it's not a place where we've got you know a lot of twists and turns but it is a place where a big lazy v8 can just sort of thunder along at 1000 2000 rpm and just get you to your destination without too much drama and I think that's part of the problem with it is that there's just not quite enough drama with it. And there's a lot of theatre, but really that's all it is. I mean, for example, if we start the car up, it is quite a nice noise. Can't complain about it. But I don't know, it just it lacks that sort of magic that you get with the TVR or the Abarth. <laughs> So while yes, this is a car that makes a lot of noise, creates a lot of smoke and goes sideways quite nicely, it is at the same time just a little bit dull. So let's hop in and let's explain why. So let's start with some of the things that this car does get right. The engine is fantastic. That 5 litre V8 is so smooth. Power delivery is really, really nice. The sound is pretty nice as well. For sure, it's not up there, you know, the same sort of standard the lights of the TVR is, but you kind of expect that because this is a much more sensible everyday car. So, you know, it's not fair to compare the rawness of something like the TVR to what you would get with the likes of this. But you know what, for what it is, it's not bad at all. And, you know, that's, that's quite a compliment. There's not terribly many modern cars that I would say make a nice sound, but this is probably one of them. 
aircraft. The general driving dynamic is also quite nice. The chassis is, is surprisingly responsive. As I said earlier, the turning is really, really strong and because it's got so much power going to relatively small rear wheels, you can control it on the throttle really, really nicely, which means you can push pretty hard, you can have quite a lot of fun in this car and you can slide it in quite a controlled and you know generally relaxed, enjoyable sort of a way. It's not hard work to drive by any measure. And again, I think that's quite a nice compliment because I think with a car like this, it would be quite easy for it to be quite a chore almost to drive it fast and have fun with it. So, so far, so good. The general interior is also really nice. Nice touch screen, the dials are nice and big and clear. No real complaints there. But there are, of course, some things which aren't so good. The one that I would criticize the most is this 10-speed automatic gearbox. I think, first of all, 10 gears in a car, that's about four or five more than any car ever really needs. It, it just doesn't really work so well. And I know why they do it, it's primarily for economy reasons and the more gears you have, the easier it is to keep the car in that sort of sweet spot of you know, ultimate fuel economy. Which incidentally actually isn't that strong in this car anyway. Driving it reasonably sensibly, you're gonna get low to, low to mid 20s to the gallon is what I'm getting so far. If you push it really hard, you're definitely getting into the teens. If you're on a nice, you know, long interstate cruise at 60 miles an hour, you'll get high 20s, but I'm yet to see it get into the 30s, even sitting with cruise control on at 60 miles an hour. So yeah, this gearbox, too many gears, first of all, and that comes up with, that comes with some, its own problems, which we'll talk about in a second. But the biggest gripe I have with it is that it's just not smooth enough. If you're going absolutely flat out, it's not so bad. You know, the, the really, really quick shift under hard throttle, it does reasonably well. If you just stick it in drive and just toodle about town, it's also not so bad. But, and it's this problem that so many, if not all automatic gearboxes seem to suffer from, that when you want to go reasonably fast, but not very fast, it just becomes so jerky. And like, if I, it's in eighth gear just now, if I drop this down one gear to seventh, it's fine. Sixth is fine. Fifth is fine fourth also fine when I get to third third tends to be a bit rough which you can probably start to see there and down into second not the worst up to third quite rough fourth reasonably smooth and it's those fourth to third to second or second to third it's just unnecessarily violent to the point that it can actually unsettle the car a little bit. You know, if you're going around a corner reasonably quickly and you do that second to third shift, you've actually got to watch for that snap bit of oversteer that comes just as that power cuts and then comes back in so unnecessarily roughly. The other big problem that you've got with a 10-speed gearbox is when you're driving it with the flappy paddles, which you're probably going to do quite a lot because when it's in drive, it just... It does horrible, unpredictable shifts. You just don't want to... If you're driving quickly, drive just doesn't work for you. So you're going to use the flappy paddles, and 10 gears is an awful lot of gears to shift between. So if you're driving along a straight bit of road like this, you're going to be in 9th or 10th gear at 40 or 50 miles an hour. Because why would you not be? You know, you want this to be a nice economical thing, because we're in no hurry. But when we eventually get to the corner at the end here, which is about five miles away, I'm going to want to drop it probably down into fifth, maybe even fourth gear for this corner. I can see it's reasonably tight. It's almost 90 degrees. And that then means you've got to start dropping down like five or six gears. And that's just nuts. And the gearbox isn't quick enough to do that. At the moment, sitting cruising in ninth gear, I'm going to drop it down five cogs. Watch how long this takes. And that's it. And again, it's just not quick enough. Another really violent shift there. You know, for a sports car, the gearbox has to be quicker than that if it's going to have this many gears. If it was just a six-speed box, that would be a perfectly acceptable you know, rate of shifting. But when you've got to be able to drop so many gears so quickly, it's got to be faster. Something that I really like about this car, and it's something which is actually common across pretty much the entire Ford range, but is never really picked up on by journalists, is the brakes are absolutely amazing. In particular, the pedal feel. And I don't know why journalists never ever seem to pick up on this, but Ford seems to be the only company, and it's the same whether it's in this Mustang, whether it's in a Fiesta, whatever it is, where the brake pedal is always really nice and firm, like it gives you so much confidence. The brakes themselves, as with any other modern car, it's got absolutely massive discs and pads on the front. 
um, I believe they're Brembo and then similarly on the rear so you're gonna have no issue getting this car to stop there is of course one disadvantage that the Mustang has over the likes of the, the TVR or at least one disadvantage which is so obvious on paper which is the sheer size of it weighing in at around about 1.7 tons it's a good you know 700 or so kilos heavier than a TVR Camaro or Griffith would be and you definitely feel that when you drive it so although this is a really nice well well tuned suspension and chassis setup you're definitely aware of the the sheer mass that this car has the two times when I would say it's most noticeable are on that initial turn in where it just doesn't although it's got a fantastic front engine it doesn't really understeer it doesn't equally doesn't give you the same sort of bite that the TVRs would so that's one time you notice it the other one and this is when no car no matter how well set up or designed it is is under braking particularly heavy braking you just you can't hide mass under those circumstances and when a car weighs anything really to be honest with you you're very very aware of of that mass when you're trying to decelerate with it especially in a road like this where it's a little bit up and down you don't necessarily have fantastic traction across all four tires you're very aware that you're trying to stop a huge amount of weight now, there are of course some interesting toys that the, the Mustang comes with and unusually for a rental car these are actually all available to me the one which is most interesting is probably line lock which we'll come back to in a second um, with the accelerometer you can see all the different g-forces you know you can plot it on this little thing I don't really understand why you would ever want that because if you're pulling a lot of g probably the last thing you want to be looking at it's a small screen in the center of the dash acceleration timers are kind of interesting so you can do this and then as soon as you start pulling away it starts the timer and it'll time how long it takes you to get from 0 to 60. again not a huge amount of point in that i would say but it's broadly interesting similarly with brake performance you know how long does it take to get from 60 back down to zero and then line lock and line lock is probably a favorite amongst um let's say a certain type of person and the, the thing that line lock does is it, it locks the the front brakes on basically on a full pressure and essentially disconnects the rear brakes from the system meaning that you can put your foot on the brake you can then press the gas and you can spin up the rear wheels and the front tires are basically brake they'll stop the car from moving forwards which means you can make a lot of noise and generate a lot of smoke for most cases this is a kind of pointless thing i suppose the time that it would be most useful if indeed it is ever useful is if you're wanting to get heat into the rear tires and probably the key time you'd ever want to do that is if you were doing a drag race which you know let's face it we're not really doing that often but you know probably wouldn't be a, a reasonable review of the mustang if we didn't have a little bit of a play with it so let's find a quiet spot where we can do this <laughs> Overall, the Mustang is definitely a nice car to drive, and when you look at it objectively, there isn't much to find fault over. Sure, the fuel economy is horrific, and it isn't the most practical car in the world, but that's exactly what you'd expect of a car of this type. The automatic gearbox is a disappointment when you're trying to drive quickly but sensibly, but the thing that really lets this car down for me, and the reason I don't see myself ever buying one, is the sensation that it's all just a bit too much of a pantomime. It's fun for a while, but in the same way that we don't feel compelled to shout, it's behind you in day-to-day -day life, I also don't feel overly compelled to buy one of these. For a couple of weeks visiting national parks in southwest America, I cannot think of anything I'd rather be driving. But after almost 1500 miles, I didn't look back after handing the keys back over to the rental agent. And that is probably the ultimate test. Thanks for watching Carbon Garage. Please like this video and don't forget to subscribe for more. Drop a comment below with your thoughts, especially if unlike me you have actually been tempted to buy one of these cars because I'd love to know how you found living with it, especially if you're from somewhere in Europe where they aren't necessarily so at home as they would be in the USA.